everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Brett Allen Show, a pop culture podcast where we interview your favorite celebrities, comedians from film and television and, and wherever pop culture exists. And today's guest will certainly not disappoint. I've been a fan for a very long time. Adam Ferrara, you know him from a million things, from his comedy, uh, hosting several seasons of Top Gear. And he also has a great podcast, which is hilarious, by the way. If you haven't heard it, we'll make sure to link it in our show notes. And Adam, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here today. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the kind words about the podcast. I'm having a good time doing it. It's called the Adam Farrar Podcast. 30 minutes you'll never get back. Yes. And you interview a lot of celebrities, comedians, mm -hmm. a lot of people. And let's start with that because I find your podcast very fascinating because you kind of take a different approach than I think most people mm -hmm. do and you always get your guests and you put these clips up on social media you're very motivating to other podcasters by the way because of how you repurpose your content but you have them always pretty much tell a story that they're kind of known for or something funny you had louis anderson talk about a story you've had all these different mm -hmm. people share their things let's talk about your show and sort of the genesis of it and and how you've sort of developed it over the years okay well it's uh uh when i when i sat down to do something i was like okay what do i want to do um and i wanted to communicate a feeling brett when i was a kid the best night sleeps i ever had is when i was i was upstairs and i heard my mom and dad and their friends downstairs laughing and they were always laughing and someone always had a problem and they were always talking about life and just trying to get through it together so i wanted to create that feeling so my show opens with you know, my family, my, me, my wife, uh, uh, my, my best friend, Phil Tag, uh, who is another comic and writer, uh, and my pal and pod producer, Marcus Stern. Um, so the four of us get together. We talk about a topic that is something I either learned from the interview I've done with the celebrity or somebody really cool that they haven't heard yet. So we'll talk about something and then I'll say, listen to this, and then we'll play the interview. And then like any good group of friends, we talk about them when they leave. Yeah. So... Then we do another 15 minutes about, did you hear that? What did you learn when they said this? So a lot of the stories um, that uh, the people have to tell me um, connect to our lives and hopefully inspires and informs us and in turn the audience. So that's pretty much the idea of the show. And I've been very fortunate to get people I wanted to talk to. You know what it is. When you have a podcast, you've got an excuse to reach out. So I'll, you know, we'll be in a production meeting and I go, and, you know, I'd like to talk to Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. And they're like, Thursday, we got him Thursday. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's fun because your publicist, your team actually asked me if I had some connections to some people that I had had. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Because I feel like in this podcasting game, people tune in to the show for the guest, of course, because mm -hmm. they find them interesting. But we're all tuning in because of you and how you interact with people and how you are able to sort of i guess disarm them a little bit and get them comfortable to like talk about things that they wouldn't normally discuss i mean you know what i mean like it's kind mm -hmm. of like i think that's what makes podcasting uh fascinating to me is kind of getting to hear things i mean if they're promoting something that's great but right if they are going to talk about a story that they've never shared or maybe something personal Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating as a podcast. Yeah, it's 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 I think I think you've hit upon it. It's an intimate setting when you talk. And a lot of times when I prepare and do my research for an interview, um, something will make a left turn. Michael Imperioli uh, from The Sopranos uh, is a uh, we ended up talking about meditation for 20 minutes. Wow. You know, and I didn't know we were going to go there. I was like, OK, so, yeah, that was fun. Um, uh, Nathan Lane was was a lot of fun. And that was that was one of the things that uh, I was really grateful for, like because I had the podcast. And like you said, people helping out other people. I had done a movie with uh, Andrea Martin. So Andrea did the show for me. Um, and she's friends with Nathan. And I couldn't believe that he knew who I was and wanted to do the show. So I got to talk to him. Um, Joe Buck, the sportscaster, I got to talk to Joe. Um, I got to talk to, you know, Jay Leno was a friend of mine. Edie Falco was a friend of mine. And it just keeps connecting, you know, like um, uh, Steve Sharippa is a friend. So one, one personal pass you want to another person. So it's a very, it's a nice, helpful community to be a part of. Yes. And 
having people on the show that are friends, which is great, mm-hmm. um, especially if they're celebrities like Edie Falco or, yeah, yeah. you know, somebody like that. And to just get them to come on and and have these moments. Do you find yourself as a podcaster when you're interviewing these people challenged in any kind of way as far as like maybe what should I ask or what shouldn't I ask or kind of get a vibe where they might be uncomfortable and you have a moment where you can sort of make them feel comfortable and to open up a little bit? Yeah, well, it's, it's, I don't start out with any intention to, there's no malice of forethought, like, oh, I'm going to ask him this, I'll get him with it. That's not my style or what I'm looking sure. to do. So I haven't really run up against that. But I think it's, um, I think it's important to do your research to know not only where you want to go or have a, a framework of the show, but be open to having the conversation go wherever it wants to go, but also to know something about that person. Um that, that could take you somewhere. And so you're not just a uh, stranger going, so like, what'd you have for breakfast? You know, like, you'll know. What's your favorite book? <laughs> yeah. but and, and that's the other thing. You could talk to so many diverse people. I mean, one of my yeah. favorite authors was Stephen Pressfield, who wrote The War of Art. And he also wrote The, uh, the Legend of Bagger Vance. And I reached out to his people. I said, I've read all his books. He invited me over his house. I went to his oh, house wow. to do the interview, you know, and it was, that was a big thrill for me. And my wife gave me some great advice when I started doing it, Brett. He's like, if you're interested, you'll be interesting. So yeah. I've always gone back to that. Like NASA was launching, um, uh, when NASA sent the rockets into space, we wanted to talk to uh, an astronaut. So I ended up talking to uh, Katie Coleman, who lived in the space station for six months. And what I found out was, She's a flautist. She plays the flute. And NASA lets you take um, lets you take some personal things with you. So she took her flute with her and she played a duet with Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull from oh, space. Wow. Yeah, from space. He's in Russia. She's in space. They're both playing the flute together. And I realized I've done nothing with my life. OK, yeah. nothing. How do you, they, they do all this stuff. Um, I have a, I have, I'm coming up actually. I have Joe Navarro. He's an FBI uh, oh, yeah. agent who uh, specializes in body language. So I'm talking to him and I'm like, well, I get to talk to him. That's really cool. I had a, a Buzzy Cohen on who was a Jeopardy champion. He won about 400 grand, I think, on Jeopardy. And, and, and I spoke to him. So that was really cool as well. And then I get to catch up with old friends um, and then talk to people that I have common interest in. I had Gabriel Iglesias on, and he's a car guy as I am, and he's into VW buses. So we're doing the interview, Brett. He goes, you want to see him? And he picks up his laptop and just takes me into the, uh, into the garage, and I'm looking at everything. So, uh, and I didn't I expect it. that to happen, so that's a lot of fun as well. I've had that happen a couple times, but the interesting one was Jake Busey, Gary Busey's son. Mm-hmm. I interviewed him just as the pandemic was kind of, full swing and he was he builds motorcycles electric motorcycles and does all of this and he did the same thing he's like do you want to see these bikes that i'm working on and it's just incredible to see him building these motorcycles and i was kind of messing with him i said well have you considered doing a starship troopers motorcycle and he's like you know what that's not a bad idea Mm -hmm. and six months later i got an email from his pr saying jake wanted to show you this and he built a Starship Troopers electric motorcycle. It's crazy. And I'm not like a super bike car person mm-hmm. like savvy, but it was fun just talking to him about those types of things. I, I want to talk about this idea. You've been in the entertainment business for a very long time, mm-hmm. and you've always seemed to remain successful and relevant and really just kind of keeping up with all of the things that people are interested in. You we'll talk about top gear at the end here, but I'm just very curious, like for somebody who's been doing this for so long, yeah. Have you ever kind of looked at things and said, you know, like this is great, but enough is kind of enough. And I'm kind of like, it's just a lot to keep up with. If that makes any sense, not any regrets or anything, but just kind of like, you know, constantly keeping the flow going and and going, Mm. how can I keep, you know, everything fresh as a creative and not just hit like a wall of of creativity and not be able to be like interested in what you're doing anymore. Right. I'm motivated by my mortgage. I got to be. There you go. Okay. Fair enough. You know, I got a wife I love very much who eats every day. So, you know, this is, (laughs) 
and I've been fortunate, Brett, to do so many different things. Um, so, and I think that that kind of helps a little bit. But yeah, it is a constant thing of keeping up with everything and having to having to change, you know, adapt to the change and embrace the change. But I get to do like, you know, Rescue Me was a great show to do yeah. because you got to do comedy and drama. Um, and then we toured the Rescue Me comedy tour, so I was still doing stand up. Um, Nurse Jackie was the same thing. Um, so I get to do comedy, I get to do drama and I get to do, you know, podcasting. And then, you know, you, you do a movie now and again, and you just, you take in what, what comes your way and you put it through the machine. We're all startup companies. We're all, yeah. we're all like everything, everybody comes to, you know, your Facebook page, your Instagram. This is what I'm doing now. So it's a different, it's a different environment, you know, to just to be a personality, you can be an actor, you can be, um, uh, a podcaster. Um, and hopefully you do them all well. And I, I go back to those, to what my wife told me, if you're interested, you'll be interesting. So I've been fortunate enough that the things I'm interested in, um, there's an audience for that. I mean, I do this thing, uh, Tuesday nights, uh, talk to me Tuesday, which is, I just turn on the camera on Facebook every Tuesday at six o'clock and thousands of people show up to watch my wife scold me. That's pretty much what it is. <laughs> I think that's what we find fascinating as people who are not part of the world that you exist in. I don't know. Mm. It's just kind of like real reality television. Yeah, it's also, you know, it's also like when I, when pod, uh, podcast kept, keeps me company when I'm on the road, those voices uh, are on my phone and, you know, I'll say, okay, let me take a minute here. And, you know, you'll be in a restaurant somewhere on the road by yourself and, you know, you look around and put your headphones on and spend some time with the, with, with the people in the phone. So I'm hoping to provide that to for, for people as well. Yeah, I think so. And you've been a part of so many great shows. Rescue Me was fantastic. That was such a fun show. Nurse Jackie was great. And all of those, thank goodness, live in infamy, you know, on streaming networks sure. and things like that. When you were going through life and you knew that entertainment was something that you wanted to do did you know right away like i want to do comedy first or i want to be on television like what was the beginning for you adam when you decided to start on this journey and i mean obviously i don't know if being known or famous was something that you had in your head or i mean what it, what was it that appealed to you uh, to get into this business it was it was the feeling of, okay, I belong here. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my story. Uh, my dad was, was my hero and my dad was really mechanical. I love, I love cars. Can't fix them, Brett. Can't fix them. My father can, my father can fix anything. My father, my father built our house with a butter knife. I mean, he could just put <laughs> everything together. So I got my love of cars by hanging out with my dad and I always wanted to be like him, but I don't have the mechanical ability. One day I'm in the garage. I'm working on the car. It's not going well, Brett. There's, the, the, the oil's leaking, blood spurting, wrenches are falling. And my father's in the, in the uh, doorway, leaning up against the doorway, smoking a Lucky. He puts the cigarette out. I'm sweating, trying to do something on the, uh, uh, on the intake manifold. He comes over, he puts his hand on my shoulder. He goes, son, look, you're going to have to get a job. You have to work at something for the rest of your life. This ain't it. So <laughs> this ain't okay. it. Couldn't do it. So I always felt less than because I worked in my father's business. He did kitchens and bathrooms and construction and stuff. So I went to college and I, I, Brett, I didn't want to go to college. My father said, you're going to college. I said, why? He goes, cause you can. He goes, my job is to give you a better life than the one I had. So pay attention cause I'm tired and I'm running out of money. So you go, okay, pop. So I go to college. I get out of college. I said, look, we've done one of your things. Let me try one of mine. And I went on stage at an open mic on Long Island where I'm from. And it just, boom, it just clicked, you know? I went, oh, you know, I don't know if you ever, ever hit a golf ball right, you get that ping. Yeah. And I, I shoot pool course. a lot when you hit, when you're in dead stroke and you just hit that, boom, and you, your English works and everything works and you're not even thinking about it. That's the feeling I got. And I remember thinking to myself, I belong here. I don't know how long I'm going to get to stay here, but this is where I have to go now. And I went and I told my dad, because I had just gotten out of college and I was still working and I tried this and he came to see it. He came, he saw my first show and I walked down to the, the office where he was to go to work the next day. And he looked at me, Brett, like that, like he's never looked at me before. Like, you know, like something was different. You know, you could, you, you could feel it. And I said, pop, I want to give this a try. And he took a long drag of his luck. He's like, do it now. He goes, do it now before your life gets complicated. But if you're going to do this thing, you better give it all you got. Because one day you're going to be looking in a mirror and there's going to be an old man looking back at you. 
and you're never going to want to think if I only tried a little bit harder. So wow. he, he gave me permission to go and do this. So everything that has come to me in answer to your question, did I know? No, I had no idea. I knew that when I did stand up, I belong there and I'm going to, I'm going to stay here as long as I can and learn my lessons here. And this will be the road I'm on. Um, so stand up took me to, you know, doing stand up in New York, doing stand up in TV and doing some TV stuff as a stand up. And then I came out to California to do, I think the tonight show. And I was a kid and uh, I got an audition for a sitcom and I got the gig and I got to do a week on a sitcom. And I was, I, I was okay. I got away with it, but I realized there's a lot here. I don't know, but I really like this too. And this is something I better learn. So I enrolled in a, an acting, uh, acting school and I learned and studied that um, because I'm like, stand up took me here. And the biggest fear, um, well, not, not the biggest fear for all standups. The, the standups uh, that I spoke to had, have this fear. I have it and I know other people that have it, but I don't want to generalize this. If you learn how to act, you're not going to be funny anymore. Yeah, you know? I've heard that several times. Yeah. Which is not um, necessarily so true, right? It's not true at all, but it's a, it's a fear that, that, that it's a common fear of, of, of me and, 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 and my buddies. So it, it took me a little bit longer to trust the method in acting. But then when I got, when I got to do specifically single camera acting, because you can get away with it in a sitcom, a multi-camera, because there's an audience there. So right. there's, a la there's a laugh, you know, when you get your laugh, you're used to that. So your timing is now our timing with the people in the scene, but it's familiar to you because of your stand-up training. Single camera is like a movie. There's no nothing. So you have to connect with the person and trust that and trust the director. I remember the first time I did a uh, single camera was on a cop show called The Job. I came in, <laughs> I did my scene, I did my first beat um, and there was supposed to be a laugh and, and I didn't hear anything. And the director went, cut. Okay, that was good, Adam. And I went, that's it? Where's the applause? <laughs> I like... Yeah. Somebody better love me now. I need reinforcement. <laughs> You're like, where's the, yeah. come on. Yeah. Ah, good job, yeah. man. You nailed it. No, we're yeah. good. Next. Now. Yeah. Pack up so and that's go. why getting to trust the, that machine took me a little bit longer because of, because of my standup. But I've been very fortunate, Brett, because this road took me down to do all this stuff, comedy and drama, and then hosting Top Gear. And then, you know, uh, so I'm really lucky. So in answer to your question, did I realize it? No. I just I just followed what the next thing was in the and and whatever instinct I might have had. I it could all be a phase and go to shit tomorrow, Brett. What could, do I know? Yeah, and that's a thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is that like you're in a business where if you're not smart, whether it be financially or whatever mm -hmm. or connections, like literally it could all just be gone. You could be canceled tomorrow, figuratively or literally, yeah. and you just don't know. You said something very interesting, and I've heard other comedians say it about, you know, if you do s television, s multicam comedies, you're not going to be funny. I, I don't know if this is true, but the impression that I've gotten from a lot of comedians that I've had is there seems to be like this unspoken rift where you, if you do comedy and then you do sit, like back in the 80s, it was like you did the clubs and then... Mm -hmm. You got on Carson and then mm -hmm. on Carson, you got like a holding deal from NBC and they held you for 15 months while they tried to write a show for you. Mm -hmm. If you got a pilot, you know, everybody talks about the 80s comedy boom. And I'm just kind of fencing my question here. But like then now it's kind of like the reverse where somebody's on a social media channel and now they're hilarious. And now they've got like a deal, you know, with a with a network. Mm -hmm. Um but my, my question is, is there this unspoken rift or this sort of thing where you have people who do it in reverse, like they're on television for years and then they decide they want to do stand up and then they feel maybe that like isn't an easy transition to go from one to the other, like from television to stand up. If that I think, oh, well, I think and, uh, if I understand your answer correctly, I think for me, I think it's easier to be a stand up and then learn how to be. Okay. An actor. I, I think it's tough to teach stand up. You need to have it. Well, acting's instinctual too, but you could, there's a craft to it. Right. There's a craft to stand up too, but you got to have it or you don't. You know, once you, you, can, you can cultivate it, but I don't think you can learn it if you don't have that instinct. It, it, it's like any other thing. You have to be 
you're kind of born to do it. I mean, you can learn how to structure, you can learn how to write a joke, you can learn how to structure a late night set. You can, these are all things you just learn. And as you get, as you get more proficient out of doing it, um, you just do the process quicker. That's what success is. Like I know that it's got too many words. I got to get to the end quicker. A joke doesn't work. It's not going to be there. It's not, they're not going to believe that coming from me. You just know, and you don't hold on to things longer, but that's, right. that's not, you, you don't hold it like, well, it should work. It doesn't move on next, you know? Um, yeah. And that's just a stand up. Uh, what you do when you, when you go to uh, as a stand up, that, that's how you learn that craft and that process. Um, for me, I'm going to say it was easy to go from stand up to TV because it just was, you know, I was, I was, I was a, a comic first to go the other way. And you as, as, also to be a comic, you got to want to be a fucking comic, you know, yeah, I mean, you, there has you, to be you just can't go, I'll you. do this. You know, right. when I came out, when I came out to LA, it was 90, it was almost, almost 2000. I came out here and there was a lot of actors that had their five minutes on stage because they wanted a development deal, but they weren't, you know, Fine. they weren't comics and you could tell. Yeah. You know, if you put if you got a bunch of comics and then you put an actor up, you can tell. Yeah, it's funny. Joel McHale was actually saying that he's like he does comedy stand up and he did that first long before mm -hmm. like the soup. Um, Jamie Kennedy, the same thing. It's like yeah. he did comedy for years. This happened to be for them acting hit first and yeah, provided them more success, but they still do it. So Joel was like, it's funny when I go do clubs, people are like, so are we going to watch him tell jokes? This is the guy from community. He's going to yeah. tell stories, you know, like, what is he going to do? Is he going to, is it going to be like, you know, a podcast where he's going to yeah. tell jokes? It's like the guys from entourage, you know, they're doing these club tours and it's like, well, are they going to do a podcast? Are they telling jokes? Like, is, you know, Doug Ellen funny? Is he going to do stand up? Like, it can be very confusing. I I appreciate your answer. It's very interesting. I, I just come from a place of fascination. That's why I do the podcast because mm -hmm. like, it's just so crazy to hear the stories of how you got to where you were and sort of the struggle. When you were doing comedy, do you feel that it's tougher to make it as a comic in New York versus LA or you do better if you maybe start in New York and go to LA? I don't know. Uh, I don't know because I only know the reality I have and it was New York. Okay. And I will tell you coming from New York to LA, I'm a better comic in New York and I still got my apartment there and I'm going back next week. Nice. You know, I'll be down to cellar. I'll be at Gotham. I'll be, you know, I'd stand, I'll be doing them um, because um, there's more stage time. Okay. There's yeah, more stage that. time. Um, and there's, um, and you got to get good quick. You know, you're down at the cellar. You don't know who's popping in. I mean, I remember, I remember when when Seinfeld was shooting um, Comedian, the movie Comedian. He bumped yeah. me three times in one week. I mean, he was very nice about it. He's like, Adam, I'm so sorry. You know, he, he was very kind to me. But I was like, <laughs> Jerry, this movie better be funny because right now it's just annoying me. So, you know, so you, you'll follow, you know, Chris Rock will show up. I see Louis when I go, CK when I go back. So these are hitters you're going to have to follow when you're in there. So you got to get good quick. So in answer to your question, my I'm a better comic in New York because I'm from there and I know that reality. And you can go out on the road, you can write something and then boil it off and see what works down at the cellar. Uh, yeah, I, you know? I've heard it's far more competitive in L.A., yeah. but you can there's like literally thousands of places that you can perform in New York that is doing comedy somewhere. Like I follow some of these uh, comics, you know, that don't have like the massive recognition, but they're funny people. Mm hmm. And they're performing at like some of the craziest locations. Like I wouldn't even know this would be a comedy club, but they're performing and they're getting on stage like seven or eight times in a night, maybe just going from sure. place to place to place. Maybe they're trying to get past at the cellar or, you know, Gotham or wherever mm -hmm. to get that next step. Well, I want to ask you one more question here. Let's talk about Top Gear because this is a great show. It lives in. Oh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, there have been several iterations of it since you did it. I think, and I'm not just blowing smoke here, but I think your run was the best and the most interesting. I think it's become very Hollywood eyes, I guess you could say now. And it's just kind of right. like, now we're just driving fast cars and blowing things up. But let's talk about that. You're on the show, you're doing it. Like, what was that experience like for you to work on a show like that? From Because from what I understand, it's 
very fast paced, very intense. Sure. Like you just literally, it's kind of like, you don't know what's going to happen from day to day. Like you're just showing up and kind of like, this is what we're doing next. And you kind of yeah. have to just go with the flow and be really on your toes. Well, it was, uh, it, the show came to me. Um, it was the last year of rescue me. Okay. Um, and, uh, and uh, Dennis, I, we were on a tour, but we were doing the Rescue Me comedy tour at the time. So it was me, Lenny Clark, um, Dennis Leary, the band. And uh, so we're on the bus Classic. after a show. And uh, we were all smoking it. So got a couple of cigarettes going. And uh, Dennis goes, what do you guys think about uh, doing one more season of Rescue Me and then shoot this thing in the head? And me and Lenny Clark went, no. No, we don't have Ice Age money. Think of us, you skinny Irish fuck. Ice um, Age money. <laughs> yeah. And he laughed. So, you know, the ne what is the next thing, you know? So he, goes, he laughed and we did the last season and I, I, I figured out what did I want to do next? I like cars, so I want to do something with cars. So I had a, a show, um, a pilot that I, I, I had pitched to history about cars um, and we shot the pilot and it didn't go, but they liked me. And they said, do you know the show Top Gear? I said, yeah, of course I do. Uh, they go, we have the rights to do the American Top Gear. And I said, Brett, I go, don't screw it up. It's a great show. Don't screw it up. Leave it alone. She goes, she goes, well, we want you to meet the meet the executive producers. And if you like it, we maybe you can be in. And I'm like, I don't want to screw it up. It's a perfect show. I don't want I don't want to I don't want to read for the part of Clarkson. and I don't want to do that. Too. Like, no, we want to do a, an American version. We want you to be you in that context. Why don't you just meet the people that are doing it? So the people that were doing it are were the BBC. So it was the mothership that was doing it. So I went to uh it wasn't like a, a typical audition, Brett, where you go to like a studio or you, you're in a casting office. This was like, go to this church parking lot, look for a Mitsubishi Evo and a bunch of English guys <laughs> and no cops. Like it was a ransom drop. So I went there, I met everybody. There was an Evo and, you know, we we're talking and everything. And it, they had Tanner and Rutt. They needed a third guy. So they put us in the car with a bunch of cameras on it. And when Tanner's rolling around doing stuff and, and we all, we just started laughing. You know, the three of us just started laughing. Um, and I went back four or five times with these guys because they kept bringing people back and filming it. And, you know, and I, I'd forgotten about it. You know, I was like, OK, I did. And then then three weeks later, I get on the call. They want to see you again. And then then once I went, I, oh, nothing's going to change. All right. This is it. <laughs> nothing's going to change. This is what I do, you know. And uh then they said, no, no, no. I said, look, I, I'm not your guy. I'm not coming back. I'm not. It, was, it was basically, it was five o'clock and I had to drive over the hill here in California. And they went, it's too much traffic. I ain't going. You're going to give me the party or not? And they said, just, just come. So I went and about six, eight months later, they offered me the gig. So I took it and I thought it was just going to be a summer thing, Brent, but I really loved the guys. Look, look I'll deny I said it, but I still love those two idiots, you know, and we still talk about each other. And uh, we still talk to each other and we're, we're all still pretty, pretty close. And I remember when we did it, I remember we would, we were doing the tonight show. The three of us were in the car doing a tonight show. And we got a call from the head of uh, history and said, if you want to announce that we're picking you up for a second season, you can. Congratulations. Wow. We're picking you up. And I remember we were all, in a, and we were all so happy in the car. And that's when I thought about it. I'm like, Oh, wow. This could be a bigger thing than I thought it was. And we all kind of, thought that kind of kind of thought the same thing. Um, and I'll tell you exactly when we bonded on the show, because we were just three guys, you know, stumbling around and we laughed a lot and we enjoyed it. But when we went to Alaska for the first year, our season finale, we went to Alaska for six days. We're driving across a glacier and we're living in the back of these trucks together. And it's not just the three of us. It's the whole crew. So there's about 25, 30 people that are all a family fighting these elements together. So you get close real quick. And I remember we were, uh, we were sitting in the back of the truck having lunch. Three of us were just eating a sandwich on the tailgate. And I said, boys, we're either going to find the show in this episode or we're going to kill each other. But by the end of it, we're going to have an answer. And we ended up uh, we ended up finding the show. And I remember the circumstances. Tanner Faust um, on the show, he had a little daughter that got bit by a dog. Oh, wow. She got bit in the face. Yes. Yeah, so it was it was uh, he was very worried. And, and there was we closed ranks around him emotionally. You know, and uh, and I, I I remember we got very close very quick because it was like man down, you know, emotionally man down. So we all instinctually did that. And when we left, we laughed. Uh, thank God uh, his daughter was OK. And um, I think and we all we all agree that's where we found 
the show, the bond we were looking for in, in, in that show. And I think that's the key to that show is we're having a great freaking time, Brett. Why yeah. time of my life? They flew me to Germany. They gave me the new Lamborghini Hurricane. They put me on the on on the uh, on the autobahn, and they said go. <laughs> so, I remember you know. that. It's. I just started my seven year old watching that we're starting from the beginning, your mm -hmm. seasons and stuff, and he loves it. It's just like the funnest thing to watch him. Just the cars racing and just. And I think you guys are what make the show like that with anything like that, you know, because there's a million iterations of that mm -hmm. show. Yeah. Ice Road Truckers, whatever. I mean, just like every kind of thing you can imagine. But you guys, you could tell that you guys got along really well. And dare I say, they didn't just pluck somebody and say, we need a face, a talking head yeah. for the show. Um, and that's not a dig, but do you know what I mean? Like, so you yeah. just you enjoy it and you guys, you're funny. And it's like, it's just a lot of fun. You are a fantastic guest. This has been so great. You're touring again a little bit. You're going I am. You can go. You can, you can get uh, the Adam Ferrara podcast. 30 minutes, you'll never get back wherever you get your podcast. Uh, you can go to my website, adamferrara.com, for my tour schedules. I don't know when this is going to drop. I am going back to New York City. Uh, this I have, will drop I have a today, this afternoon. This afternoon? Yeah. God. Look at you, you industrious thing. Well, I'm getting ready to go on vacation for seven days, and uh, I'm going back to New Mexico to see friends and family. So oh, I cool. Leave. Yeah, tomorrow morning, 5 a.m., so I've got PR people emailing me, asking me questions. So right. I'm trying to get it out, but I wanted to get this out before I left and let it cool. sit. What's yeah. your little boy's name? What's your seven-year-old's name? His name is Jared, yeah. Jared! Jared, hi, it's me, Rutledge Wood. Okay, it's not Rutledge Wood, it's Adam. But uh -huh. Rutledge Wood, Tanner Faust, and Adam say hello to you and want to thank you for watching Top Gear, my friend. You're seven years old, okay? Get a job. Get a job. <laughs> save up and buy a cool car. All right. Yes. Yes, uh, go to adamferrara.com. We'll link that on our show notes. There's the podcast. There's the tour. There's Top Gear. Mm -hmm. There's Nurse Jackie. Rescue Me. Uh, yep. With uh it's just uh, Facebook yeah. Tuesday nights. Talk to me Tuesday. Come by, say hello. It's just a conversation we have with 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 a, a bunch of people. Uh, and I thank you for having me on, my friend. Thank you.